And so, uh, without further ado, um, we're going to get some interesting information here on the dark web and kind of dark web and learning a little bit more about the uh, pricing and interesting things there. So, uh, please, let's uh, give me a warm round of applause for uh, Emma uh, Zavios and Anne Mer Merriweather. Hi, everyone. Uh, as he just said, my name is Emma Zavios, and this is my colleague, Anne Addison Merriweather. And we are from Terbium Labs, a dark web data intelligence company. And we're here to talk to you about the way information appears on the dark web, what the dark web is, why that information is interesting, and why the way the information appears and is recorded and is observed is such a problem. And so we're going to be going through and telling you a little bit about a tisket, a tasket, a dark web shopping basket. Um, OK, so an overview of what we're going to do today. So first, we're going to talk about what the dark web actually is, and then talk about why we study the dark web, what studies exist, what the problems with those studies are, and then how we propose we can fix those problems. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, let's talk about what the dark web actually is. This in image is obviously not to scale, but it represents the internet or the World Wide Web. So the World Wide Web actually has two major components. The clear web, which is the internet that we use every day. Uh, BuzzFeed is an example of the clear web. You can type in a URL and go there and you don't have to go through any sort of special software other than what's already part of the internet or like a password or anything. Uh, on the other hand, there's the deep web. The deep web is not necessarily nefarious, but it's anything that you need special software or a password to access. The bank account summary page for your bank account is an example of the deep web. Everyone has it, but you can't just type in Emma Zabios' bank account summary and expect to just go there. There's some steps involved. Now, a subset of the deep web, most of the deep web is, all the, is really benign things that just need, you need special permission to access, but a subset of the deep web is the dark web, which I'm going to talk about on the next slide. You have probably heard of the dark web before if you're at this conference. And when you think about the dark web, you probably think of a multi-good marketplace. A multi-good marketplace, the best example or one of the most famous is either Silk Road, uh, gone but not forgotten, or Alphabet. Uh, these, are, these are places where commerce happens. The kind of commerce that happens there tends to be a lot of different goods that can be all be listed and you can engage in whatever kind of commerce you want. There's no restriction to what goes up there. So that those goods can include things like drugs, they can include things like stolen digital media, but they also include things that lead to fraud. There's a huge criminal ecosystem for fraud on the dark web. The kinds of goods that end up being traded and used for fraud are things like stolen credit and debit cards, uh, stolen identity documents, like someone's social security card or someone's uh, scanned, Im scanned information about someone's dr driver's license, excuse me, W-2s, uh, or even credentials for websites. Uh, for example, there is now like a huge trade in stolen rewards points for different websites. You can buy Sephora points or, um, or points for hotels. And you can buy those on either these multi-good marketplaces or on single good marketplaces. Single good marketplaces are set up to allow for only one type of good to be bought and sold. Usually that good is a payment card because payment cards are basically just like money. So people are, so they're very desirable and they're all kind of the same. Finally, we also look at discussion forums. Discussion forums are places where commerce is not actually built into the platform. There isn't like an e-commerce plugin that allows you to add things to cart and check out, but you can still arrange for a transaction to take place by sort of talking to someone, either trading tips or saying like, oh, I see you're selling what I would like to buy. Let's engage in that transaction together. So there's this robust criminal economy and a large amount of it supports fraud. We care about that fraud because, well, it affects us. It affects companies, it affects individual users, and be because of the scale at which it operates, it affects a lot of people all at once. So we decided to do a meta-study to see all of these different, a lot of different people are interested in looking at fraud. Some of them are government organizations, some of them are private organizations like ours. If they've already done this study, maybe we can look at a bunch of them and see if there are any trends over time. So I'm, so I'm going to pass this over to Ann Addison and she can tell you sort of what we found from this meta study. All right, so periodically different researchers put out reports on the going rates for these different goods. 
Um, we primarily looked at industry reports rather than academic reports. Uh, current academic reports on pricing tend to focus on drugs, which is not really what we're interested in. Um, so as Emma said, we wanted to do a meta study of these reports and we looked at 22 from 18 different report sources to see if we could draw some conclusions about trends in dark web pricing. Um, they were all published between 2013 and 2018 and some sources put out their reports on a yearly basis, but for the most part, they come out pretty sporadically. Um, also, as you can see up here, only about four of them included something resembling a methodology, so they're really not clear on how they're arriving at the prices they're reporting, if they're conducting surveys, or if they're just kind of, you know, pulling numbers out of a hat, as it were. Um, so as Emma said, we're really focused on the prices for digital goods that are used for fraud, um, in particular payment card information. And within some of these categories that we looked at, payment card information, identity information, account information, we found about 22 product categories within those types. And so when we look more closely at some of what we found, it becomes apparent why we had 22 categories. Um, this slide shows a sample of the prices we saw for payment card information. Um, and you can see it's listed from uh, most useful to least useful. So on the very bottom, we have credit card details for $50. What does that mean? That doesn't really tell me very much. What type of credit card is it? Where did it come from? Is it actually more than one credit card? Because $50 seems like kind of a lot. Um, then a little bit above that, we have a little bit more information. So um, payment card number with CVV2, that's the, the three-digit code on the back of a credit card. So that's a little more helpful. I have a little bit more of an idea of what's being included in this listing. Um, and then the one sort of odd thing about both this one and the one next to it is they mention bank ID number or bank information. But that's kind of a weird thing to call out because every credit card number contains um, the bank ID number or the BIN, um, which is the first six digits of a credit card number. And trying to sell a payment card without a BIN is like trying to sell a car without an engine. It just doesn't really make sense. Um, so as you can see, these categories, some of them are kind of weird. Um, and then at the very top, we have probably the most useful uh, that we pulled out of a report. And it gives us the most information about, uh, it's a visa, the level it is, where it came from, and the type of data that's included, so track one and track two data. So why does it matter that these are all so very different? Um, because we could be comparing apples and oranges, or oranges and tangerines, and oranges and oranges, and we really can't tell because we can't compare between different studies. So even we who are pretty well versed in this stuff look at these and kind of go, what are they talking about? So you can imagine that if you're reading these reports as someone who doesn't know very much uh, about this, these types of marketplaces, it really only kind of serves to, to encourage confusion, which is the exact opposite of what we would like to have. <laughs> So not only is the lack of clarity in labeling an issue, um, but as I mentioned before, only four of the reports included something that even resembled a methodology, which means that most of the reports aren't transparent about how they collect their data. So for example, while anecdotal evidence suggests that prices fluctuate throughout the year around things like Black Friday or tax season, um, we can't validate whether or not that's true if we don't know when these reports are, um, when these reporters are performing surveys, how long the surveys lasted, you know, did they pull their data in May, did they pull it in October, is it an amalgamation of data that they've seen throughout a year, we don't know. Um, we also can't actually know that the data cited is coming from surveys. Um, while some of the studies clearly aggregated multiple prices into averages, Others appeared to share data points from one or two listings that may or may not actually be representative of the market at all. So again, why does this matter? Why do we care? Without transparent methodology, or better yet, consistent collections, we really can't draw conclusions about market pricing. Even point in time descriptions of pricing are kind of questionable. And if we can't reliably describe market pricing, we can't really say how stable or not the market is or generally say that we understand them. 
and that might not seem like a big deal, but understanding the economics of the market for fraud-related goods could inform law enforcement and private sector efforts to combat fraud by helping us better prioritize our efforts and evaluate their effectiveness. So how do we fix dark web price reporting and research? There's sort of three main things that we've laid out. Um, the first thing is the dark, studying the dark web, like the dark web itself is a very young phenomenon, uh, and studying the dark web is basically as young or even younger. So when you have a problem, you don't, and, you, and you're encountering it for the first time, you don't know what to do, steal a solution from someone else who has figured it out. And so the, the industry that we propose stealing a solution from is economics. We think that we should follow economics, ex economics example and create a price index or a dark web shopping basket. By defining a basket of goods that everyone agrees is uh, indicative of general pricing trends on the dark web and having everyone use it, saying, say, we think it's important to survey and collect X number of payment cards of Y different types, uh, X number of sets of credentials of Y different volumes or whatever, we can then compare across different research efforts and track a sort of price, sort, general pricing trends over time. Secondly, it's important to define a shared terminology. We all need to be speaking the same language if we want to work together. So even just coming together and agreeing on what we mean when we say one payment card would be incredibly helpful. Otherwise, we simply just can't know when two people are, are uh, are engaging in the same theoretical set of research if they're actually talking about the same thing. It might seem obvious what a payment card is when you're thinking about it. You have multiple of them in your wallets right now, I'm guessing. But you saw beforehand that researchers who are embedded in this field and, who's, and who have spent a lot of time thinking about this define these products really differently. We need to agree on what's important about each good and identify them accordingly. The people are basically, they're reporting what goods are called, but not exactly what they are. And what they are is actually important. Finally, we need to establish a consistent research methodology. Agreeing on how to perform studies of the dark web allows us to work together as an industry and allows different organizations to build on each other's work instead of having everyone construct sort of their own projects all in a line that are essentially doing very, very similar things. It's important that we collect this information consistently over time and that we work together. That's basically the bottom line. We need to work together on this because we have, a, in the fight against the dark web in general and dark web fraud in particular, we have a lot of disadvantages. The dark web has a lot more resources and also fewer restrictions. Dark web researchers have to follow the law. Dark web uh, criminals and fraudsters don't. We need to double down on, on our efforts because we have so many restrictions. And they, although they're not working obviously from a centralized playbook, are working together. They, they will share new tips and tricks to evade law enforcement. They will work together to, to innovate and to specifically uh, counter law enforcement or private sector efforts. But the private sector has not responded in the same way. It's still very focused because these are a lot of private organizations, all of which are trying to make money. They're all competing with each other to be the best instead of working together to fight this larger force. So overall, basically, we need to work together. We need to come to a cooperative agreement on how we're going to counter this force because the real losers at the end of the day won't be private organizations like, like ours or like other companies. It will be end users. It will be consumers who have to suffer the effects of this fraud. So finally, I hope that this was informative. I hope you all feel empowered to really promote consistent research methodology in your daily lives. And if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them. You can also ask us questions at either of the email addresses or my Twitter listed on the screen. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a comment earlier on your slides about the uh, bank identification numbers. Yes. Uh, so what they're selling there are specific bank identification numbers for people that want to target a specific bank as opposed to getting just a random thing from their pool. 
Yeah, but that but that's still not a very good way of defining it in that case because bank identification numbers are part of every credit card number, so they're already kind of li in a lot of cases already listed in that way. Like, no, no, I mean yeah. they, you get them no matter what, but the, right. the, the in advance of the purchase, the purchaser says, "I want this bank." Give me only stuff from this right. bank, and so uh, they only get a subset. So that's mm -hmm. why they're charging more because they're charging us, uh, targeting a specific bank as, right, as opposed okay. to a random card. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, do you have a question? I Sorry. Have, I have one <laughs> one quick question. Um, why are there not more methodologies published, and do you risk losing your ability to collect this data when you? give a verbose description of how you got it. Well, I think you're right that there, that is part of the reason why a lot of organizations don't publish their methodologies um, is possibly they're worried about if there is something in there that, get, that they perceive gives them an edge against uh, against like the dark web or a specific forum, they, especially if they disclose precisely which forums they're collecting it from, it does risk having them innovate against it. However, I do think also that because these, or, these reports are published by private sector organizations, there's a certain amount of we don't want to be forthcoming because then our competitors might steal our ideas. So it's sort of, we, and also I think there are methodologies that we could agree on that are not so specific that it would give uh, that would give these criminal forums or organizations an edge, but would be specific enough that we could all essentially play with the same playbook. Um. Of the uh, various reports you looked at, I mean, how many of them seem to sort of hype up the numbers or exaggerate things just to, for publicity's sake? Um, that was another issue that we identified, um, and we tried to sort of get at with the cherry picking, with the cherry picking slide. Uh, it's unclear whether these are true surveys, or obviously there's there's value to being able to come out with a very splashy headline saying like, "We found your passport for two dollars," like or. More, ac more commonly, people think, think data should be worth a lot more, so they're more likely to say, we found your passport for $100. So because the methodology isn't really discussed, it's hard to know whether this is actually an accurate representation of the market or whether people are cherry picking data that will allow them to, com to do better marketing campaigns. Thanks. Uh, you talk about the need for consistent methodology and a price index and stuff. Who do you see doing that? Are you hoping to just grassroots it and there's some sort of community consensus or is there an authority figure or like who, who's going to make that happen? I don't think we're really at the point of an authority figure yet. Um, I'm co we were kind of hoping for more of a grassroots take, possibly aided by if there are more, if there's more government research, research going into the subsection of the dark web. Right now, a lot of it is focused, as Anna Essen said, on drugs and other sort of um, and other activities on the dark web. But if it shifts to fraud, it would be nice to see. Uh, certain organizations may be taking the lead, whether that's either larger research organizations or uh, a government or a government research sponsored research taking the lead on that. I think that's more likely than having like, a government agency come in, if that makes sense. In that context, then, do you feel like the government has done a, an objective and consistent measurement with their CPI? Um, I have to say I don't know. Uh, I think it is. I think it's better than nothing, but I'm not an economist, so I can't really say. Any more questions? No, thank you so much. <laughs>